For views across Africa and the rest of the world, this is NC Continental Prime. I am Dakbo Adigboyi. Our coverage tonight begins in Nigeria with uh, security martyrs where we understand that the menace of kidnapping has once again reared its ugly head. Now, this time in Kogi State, the non-central part of Nigeria, where kidnappers have abducted passengers of two Abuja-bound buses in the Inele Etike Ogugu, a new road area of Kogi State East District. The incident involved GIG and ABC buses heading to Abuja from the eastern part of the country. The GIG bus left Umaya in Abu State at 7.30 a.m. local time on Saturday on its way to Abuja. In the wake of the abduction, GIG contacted security services to track the abductees. Meanwhile, the Kogi State Police Command has confirmed the incident. The command spokesperson, William Aya, in, on Monday in a statement, said the divisional police officer of the area, that's local vigilantes and hunters, had been in the bush in an effort to rescue the victims. Still on security matters, in northwest Nigeria, officials say at least 35 women are missing after kidnappers seized guests returning from a wedding in Katsina State. Police spokesperson Abuba Kaliu said suspected armed bandits ambushed the kidnapped uh, about uh, and kidnapped about 35 women returning from the wedding in the Sabua area. However, the state's internal security commissioner, that's Nasser Umoaz, uh, gave a higher figure, saying more than 50 persons were seized on the way back from the Damari village after escorting the bride to the groom's home. Umoaz said officials visited the village and we are told that 53 persons we are taken. Let's move to election matters now. We are in Nigeria's northeast, that's Adama State. The governor, Adamo Fintiri, has commended the judiciary for upholding the tenets of democracy by reaffirming his victory at the 2023 elections. Fintiri, in a statewide broadcast on Monday, said the Supreme Court's verdict has brought an end to the tension in the state, which he believes is premised on rumors and misinformation by the opposition party. The governor assured that he will ensure the prosecution of the former resident electoral commissioner, Hudu Ari, and all those who aided him in his bid to divert the mandate of the people. At 1st January 2024, has officially closed all the noise on the 2023 election in Adama State. The days of lying and deceits are over. The moments of false propaganda and cheap talks are gone. It is no longer in contest that Adama State is the state for the People's Democratic Party. This has been affirmed both at the polls and in the courts. The people have spoken loudly and clear. A testament to this is our latest victory at my Balwa constituency of the State House of Assembly. I must appreciate INEC for standing firm as an unbiased electoral umpire in this election, even when its resident electoral commissioner, REC, under the leadership of Hudu Ari, acted irresponsibly and unlawfully. The Supreme Court, in its judgment, has condemned the action of the REC as an act of irresponsibility and criminality. As for those who connive with the REC to make us pass through those democratically embarrassing moments, I want to assure you once again that we owe it a duty to prosecute all of them according to the dictates of the law. This is the only way we can protect our electoral process and democratic culture from undue abuse. The honorable justices at different layers of the courts have indeed painstakingly dissected the petition brought at various levels and came out with a judgment that resonated with the people of Adama State. A judgment that is fair and just. Indeed, 
This has reaffirmed our belief in the judiciary as the last hope of the common man. Let's now head to Blair Tuesday to where residents have been commended for their peaceful conduct during the just concluded rerun National Assembly elections in the state. The elections were conducted in six local government areas of just north, just south, just east, Basa, Barakinladi, and Riyam in Plateau North Senatorial District. Now, New Central's Chizaban Nonwe tells us more. The 2024 rerun elections in Plateau State and some other states in the country may have come and gone, but the aftermath is what matters to observers. One of them is the suspension of the INEC electoral officer for just north local government area in connection with the missing ballot papers for the Federal House of Representatives in Tudumwada Carbon Woods. We appreciate the action of the resident electoral commissioner in the state for swift action about the investigation of election officer, electoral officer. We do not just seek investigation, but we request that arrest and prosecution should, should be meted on the officer to serve as deterrent for people who would always take advantage of a system that has been established to serve every Nigerian and to avoid any problem. Mr. Parkin regretted that some measures were not put into consideration for the elections to accommodate the physically challenged. We commend the electorate and citizens of, for peaceful conduct yesterday, despite late arrival of election materials, insufficient ballot papers, especially insufficient ballot papers, especially for the House of Representatives, and no provision of voting aid for the physically challenge. There was a peaceful protest by supporters of the PRP who felt they were shortchanged in the electoral exercise. Some of the aggrieved voters spoke to journalists. The INEC members came today, they said they were coming around 3.30. So we've been waiting. You can see people all around waiting to vote. No materials to vote. No pilot papers. We have somebody there. No, we are waiting. Since morning, I'm with my baby. I have to do an education. So since morning, I'm here. I'm waiting. I will not go home. Though the by-elections have come and gone, its lessons remain for stakeholders, especially the electoral umpire. It is therefore expected that efforts will be put in place to draw on the learning points of the past exercise to improve the processes of future pools in Plateau State and indeed Nigeria. In Jaws for New Central, I am Chizoba Anyui. A cross-section of Nigerians have expressed concern as food prices continue to rise sharply. Now, uh, consumers in Lagos say if the rising cost of food persists while wages remain stagnant, managing finances will become increasingly challenging for households. They call for immediate intervention to address both rising prices and stagnated incomes if inflation is to be brought under control. Now, New Central's Neomani tells us more. Here is a view of what a food item list for an average Nigerian home looks like, with items such as rice, beans, curry, vegetable oil costing nearly a fortune. For me to stock my home for a month, ha, it would take like 250k. Yes, for you to buy everything, the gary, the beans, the rice, everything. Rice is even worse, because at least rice was before you, you can cook or caution with anything, your family will eat, but now rice, the kind of rice is one, one five for the clean one, Why the Nigerian rice is 1,001. With one full of stone. So it's only God that will help us. For restaurant owners like Israel, who makes soup and stew, which is accompanied by a Nigerian swallow or rice, amongst others, the choice to cook these revolves around luxury or necessity. But everything now for Nigeria is so expensive, and uh, life in my own house. If I want to eat food, because I, I'm, I'm not yet married, so I will know the kind of food that I will, I will buy, so that, because everything, everybody now is managed, everybody is managed. The minimum wage in Nigeria has been steady at 30,000 Naira since 18 April 2019, although there has been calls for an increase to 200,000 Naira and even 450,000 Naira. The dream seems far-fetched. 
the margin we had before was from 18,000 to 30, which was over 100%. And the question is, even 100% of 30,000 leaves us at 60. Can that take Nigeria worker home? As the rise in food costs push Nigeria's inflation rates to 28.9%, for most Nigerians, some of those food items have become essential commodities. So oh, before, I used to buy a bag of rice, I don't have a bag of rice, sometimes quarter, but now I don't even bother to buy it again. We just, like, we eat everything we see, not what we like, like before, just anything we see, we eat. Just told my children, don't waste food, though. Before, they are full flask to school, I can fool it, but now, I have to ration it, so that sometimes they come back with food, but now, they will finish, mommy, ah, that food is not okay, but manage it. Staple food items that many Nigerians rely on for sustenance have seen substantial price rises. The average price of a carton of noodles have increased to 5,000 naira, naira, while a bag of rice now costs 70,000 naira on average. Plantains, a commonly consumed vegetable, are selling for 500 to 1,000 naira per five strands. The cost of a kilogram of Titus fish and chicken has risen to 3,000 naira and 3,500 naira, respectively, with others like bread yum and egg costing nearly an arm or leg. These rising prices outpace Nigeria's minimum wage, which has become insufficient to cover the basic needs of average person giving additional living expenses such as transportation, health care and housing. Is it likely to get better or should Nigerians brace up for the days ahead? While many hope that Nigerian government does something quickly about the situation, a general term, thank you used for this kind of period is called a survivor mode in Nigeria. In Lagos for News Central, Ni Omani. Now, similarly, let's also tell you that residents of Mina, the Niger state capital in Nigeria's north central, are protesting the high cost of living in the country, are blocking major roads within the metropolis. The protesters said the rising cost of food items and poor government efforts in arresting the situation has forced them to block major roads so that government will hear their cry. The deputy governor of the state, that's Yakubu Gaba, while addressing the protesters, said the government is aware of the pain and hardship families are facing with uh, this current situation. Economic analyst Akin Fatuke will join us to talk about this after the break. Stay with us. You're watching NC Continental Prime. And of course, uh, to shed more light on the economic uh, situation in Nigeria, we are joined right now by economic analyst Akin Fatuke, who joins in uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time, Akin. Thank you very much, Dr. It's nice to be here. All right, now uh, let's talk about uh, the economic factors that contribute to the current economic uh, trend uh, of the rising, you know, constant rising cost of living in Nigeria. How do they impact the overall, you know, economic landscape of the country? Back to security. Mm. It is growing insecurity surrounding um, factor inputs. The farmers get into their farms to be able to farm. And before the present government came into being, uh, remember a large swath of the Northeast, North Central, were in the hands of uh, non-state actors. I'm talking of Boko Haram, I'm talking of um, ISIS enabled, and they were not get, able to get to their farms. Um, they were pay, paying tolls to the overlords. I know um, Debbie of charge before his death made a bit of an incursion. We thought we had gained a little um, a mileage, but I am afraid as we speak today, it has grown worse. Second factor, of course, is the issue surrounding last year. If you remember the flooding that came from the Lago Time opening, that Nigeria was not forward thinking and making sure that irrigation is properly harnessed. And that 
swapped and killed many of the little crops that um, were able to produce. The third factor is a very interesting one that bought, and it is the culture of lie and lying and lying. Uh, we lied to ourselves. Those who rule us were lying to us that we were getting rice, uh, millows in the east, and all that, and that strategic reserve was there. But when the buffeting came, where were the rice pyramids? They were just nowhere to be found. Mm. The fourth factor, of course, naturally would be uh, the yields. Even if everything was going on um, fine, the yield per hectare of land in Nigeria is grossly inefficient. I mean, I, so for this I, I can you have Nigeria, highlighted quite a number of interesting factors. Sorry to interject. But uh, let's also look okay. at policy, policy initiatives, uh, particularly by the current administration. We know what the prices were three months ago, five months ago, six months ago, and now what they are currently saying, you know, in the market. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that package by knee can come up to just give you an idea of what, you know, the prices are when it comes to the grassroots level. Now, looking at the policy initiatives, you know, that's, for instance, what you have on your screen, an average uh, uh, budget for a family just on feeding per month, household items. Uh, what the prices are going for right now compared to what it used to be three months ago, what it used to be five months ago. And then this current administration came into power, introduced some policies that we thought uh, would uh, boost the economy. But would you say they are yielding any form of dividend yet? In the short yesterday terms, no, they cannot. Yeah, um, they are real ratchet effect will come much later but between now and much later you know there's so much hardship uh, two of the main um the policies that was embarked by these governments is known to all trying to align the exchange rates and then of course removal of petrol subsidy this has virtually caused the hike in urban inflation and you just spoke in and you if you just spoke in about food inflation at 29% headline and going to about 30, 32% food is just worsening. And when this is not backed by at least a minuscule of a population who are in the public and um, civil service uh, in terms of um, wage increases, that will take just a minuscule, uh, what we witnessed in Niger State, is an amalgam of those who are in civil service and those who are not even looking up to these uh, wage increases. But I think the government decided that they were going to try and do something by way of what you call palliatives or what you call um, humanitarian affairs. But what has happened, that place has now become a den of robbers. People who have gone in there have just gone there to go and enrich their pockets. And so work done, zero. So these two policies that government has enunciated, leaving it to market forces initially, and from what um, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Cardoso, enunciated today, I said, no, we are not going to leave it to market forces. We are going to be trying to intervene. That intervention is coming a little bit too late. In all fairness, also, I know that late last year, I remember that for, um, the previous regime decided that they were going to ban some, some, some items, including food, to be able to help boost local production. But we produced nothing. IDP camp was growing at disproportionate rate. Population growth was about 3 to 3.5%. When the GDP growth in itself was less than 2%, so we were in a position of trying to overfeed upon the fact that the little that we had was being mismanaged. Uh, I, I think, on a serious note, with mm. the kind of adequate intervention that I begin to see to help boost import because of our import dependence, to help the farmers and look at the security of the farmers and in fact that is one I mean talking about to, talking that about boosting imports uh, this is just on the side there was also a report that uh, the government uh, you know wants to 
uh, jack up uh, import duties, particularly at the ports. Uh, and right now, there's a bit of scare that it would uh, have ripple effect, you know, across uh, 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 several sectors of the economy. But that aside, let's look at the inf uh, inflation. Where, how do you suggest the Nigerian government can actually address uh, the challenges associated with uh, the rising cost of living on a daily basis now, uh, as we see it? And what monetary policies do you think should be considered to help manage this effect? So it doesn't become, you know, out of hand. We know what the price of the naira to the dollar is at the moment just in the space of uh, three weeks. So how can all of this be controlled and contained? Uh, preferably if you can respond in 30 to 60 seconds. Well, let's make it 60 seconds. Okay. And what you said, to keep aside, um, should clearly say that um, the thinking cap is just not there. Policy pronouncements on one hand, the keys between policy pronouncements, monetary. I heard Dr. Cardoso say it today, that it should be aligned. Uh, the, the, the import duty jack up by the customs. I'm afraid I have to mind my language here. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's so asinine. It makes little or no sense to the overall objective of what we are trying to look at. So now getting back to inflation, um, what I think government needs to do, again, is for the coordinating minister of the economy, the tax review managers who are all also looking at ways and means of making a tax much more efficient by taking double taxation out of it. And the central bank itself should not only be on and up to making sure they intervene like yesterday. Now, I repeat that, like yesterday, I'm not even saying now to make sure that all agencies of government should be aligned and nobody should be working in silos, including uh, the, the custom duties that you have mentioned. Now, um, can we then talk about low hangers? Uh, that why I tell you the truth, just I like to tell myself the truth. Our time still awaits. Mm. Um, let us try our possible best to do a bulk purchase. I, I want schools to now go into what you call young farmers, let them mm. come into a part of law that we are saying can do a bit of competition. Each home, mm. each home, as much as possible, should have what we call a garden around. Now, if you don't have a garden around, the next person has a garden around, you could kind of do a partnering. And this is where CDAs uh, will not have to come right. into being. While they are looking at that, we are also making sure we support ourselves right. by way of making sure we secure ourselves and we secure our lives. All right, I can, uh, Fatuke, mm -hmm. always a delight. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dakwa. You look so well fed. Uh, I'm trying <laughs> to, when I grow up, I want to be like you, Dakwa. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Thank you for Thank the compliments. You. Uh, uh, of course, uh, once again, appreciate now, on a very sad note, uh, veteran actor and uh, folk singer Jimmy Sholanke is dead. The legendary poet and playwright died on Monday at the age of 81. He reportedly died while, died while being rushed uh, from his uh, country home in Iquara, Remo, in Remo, not local government area of Ogun State, to a hospital in Ilishan. The late Shulanke was said to have been in and out of hospital from December until he died on Monday. Dixon Awolaja, who represents Remonot State Constituency at the Ogun State Assembly, confirmed the exit of the highly gifted artist. The late Shulanke was known for Konji Harvest, uh, Shongo, and many more. And uh, he was also fondly referred to as Uncle Jimmy. On memories there uh, reminds me while growing up watching some of his uh, very interesting plays uh, may so rest in peace we stay in West Africa where of course lawmakers in Senegal on Monday debated an unprecedented move to delay this month's presidential elections which sparked clashes outside Parliament and has prompted international concern security forces used tear gas to disperse small groups of opposition protesters outside the National Assembly the sporadic clashes were a rare sight in the normally calm area downtown of Dakar. 
Now we have police and security forces backed up by heavy vehicles. We are mobilized to protect parliament. Ce n'est pas de ce n'est pas de savoir si on a peur ou pas. La question de, actuellement c'est de savoir si on est prêt à à laisser le, 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 le régime en place dérouler son agenda politique ou, ou dire non. Et la réponse pour moi elle est simple, elle est de dire non. Pas si ce rapport aura lieu ou pas. En tout cas, l'essentiel pour moi c'est de dire non. C'est c'est vraiment de dire non quoi. Parce que si on ne dit pas non, le régime en place continuera à dérouler son agenda. Moi, je suis partisan de la République. Je veux que la République continue. Je veux que le calendrier républicain soit respecté. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has delivered a keynote address on the first day of the four-day annual Investing in African Mining and Diver Conference in Cape Town. The conference, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, aims to facilitate dialogue and provide a platform for mining industry investors and mine owners. During his keynote address, the president made a plea to investors to ensure that communities around mines also benefit from mining. He also assured investors that the energy crisis in South Africa is being addressed. That as you extract, as you invest to extract these minerals, there is a duty upon you for two things, to make sure that the communities around which these mineral resources are extracted become part of the wealth creation <clears throat> that you are extracting. Now, we put in place an electricity action plan where government has taken several critical measures to improve the performance of our existing generation fleet and to add new electricity capacity. By 2040, an additional 9 million tons of copper will be required each year to keep pace with the global demand. As the home of some of the world's largest and highest quality copper deposits, Zambia recognizes our crucial role in meeting this demand. As you meet, we call for investment partnerships to power this new green. Accused one in the Senzo Mayua's trial, Muzika Sabia is on the witness stand at the Pretoria High Court. Sabia claims that he was assaulted by police and forced to sign confession papers. He further told the court that 2020 was not his first time he was arrested in connection with Senzo Mayua's murder as was arrested in 2019, assaulted and suffocated by police. On Friday, the state wrapped up its case in the within a trial with the dentist to examine accused number two, Dance Bongani Thanzi, telling the court that Thanzi was not assaulted. Sabia is the defense first witness. Now, to discuss this, we are joined by Elton Romeo Hart, a law clinic attorney, University of Johannesburg. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening and good evening to our viewers up in the West. All right. Now, let's talk about uh, Dr. Thabang Holwa's evidence suggesting that there was no sign of assault on accused number two, particularly during his dental examination. How much does this impact defense claim that accused to was assaulted? For me, the doctor's um, evidence, and we must now know the doctor is not a doctor that is a general practitioner. He's a dental surgeon. So his expertise lies in your mouth and the surrounding areas like your nose that also is adjacent to your mouth to check for injuries, to check for um, dental work that needs to be done. He's not a general practitioner where you would now do a thorough medical examination because he can make observations, but so can you and I make observations. So I don't put, I would never put a lot of emphasis and weight to the evidence that he has given pertaining to the injuries because he never asked the accused person to take off his clothes so that he could see. And even if the accused person had internal injuries that caused internal bleeding or maybe a broken rib, he wouldn't have known it because by the look of at a person, you can't really see that he's got blunt force injuries that's below the right. surface. So are like, you suggesting so that uh, the doctor's uh, case is inadmissible in court? 
I won't say his evidence is inadmissible, but his evidence would not be, be nothing more than what you and I can observe also from a witness by seeing a person to say, okay, I saw he had a scar on his, uh, on his cheek or not. But more than that, you can't put it as expert witness in there. It's admissible, but I don't think it carries a lot of evidential weight when coming to say that these guys were not. He even conceded to say that he could, he could not see that the guys were, were tubed, as they said, they used plastic bags to suffocate them. From his observation as a dental surgeon, he would not be able to see that. So the evidential way, this evidence is allowed. Is it relevant is another question. And is it the evidential way that it carries to prove that whatever the uh, defense team and the accused persons is saying happened to them, he cannot with absolute certainty exclude what they are saying happened to them. Now let's talk about the defense uh, being uh, bringing the accused on a stand. Now, would you say this is in order? Yeah, for me it's in order because they're the only persons because accused one, he was um, sort of half um, tortured and uh, allegedly tortured and tubed and electrocuted, but it was never in the presence of the other uh, person. So he can only talk about what happened to him and he's his only witness. Because um, as he said, he was with police officers all the time and they took him around to different venues where they tortured him and he's the only one that can actually corroborate his story. So he needs to get onto the stand and tell the court, listen, yeah, this is what happens. And, and then accused number two will have to come and do likewise to say that he was taken to a municipal building where he was also tortured. So it's inevitable, but they just need to stick to what happened to them and not necessarily dig into the merits, but just on the days that they were booked out from the various police stations and what happened to them pertaining to the injuries that they sustained as a result of what the police officers allegedly did to them on that specific uh, days, like in May and in June. Another aspect, of course, that we consider interesting uh, was the absence of the golden tooth on Nthanzi. And this contradicts claims by witness who were in the house on that day. How significant is this revelation? That is very significant because now it can already uh, sort of half say you cannot really rely on the evidence that was given by these witnesses. And it might speak to the defense narrative that this is a concocted story and it really, how they say that robbery happened, that botch robbery that it now looks like a contract killing happened and who was the role players that was in the house, sort of, it means that they were adamant, and I know uh, when they were asked under cross-examination, and they were adamant that they saw the gold teeth, they uh, gave proper explanations. So this works in favor of the defense, where this uh, dentist came to testify now. You could see there was no dental surgery done on it, and like a gold teeth removed, or even that covering that they normally put over the teeth uh, with gold. So that works in the defense's favor, and somehow these little bits, small bits, adds up and it might come to a point where we say um, we should be uh, actually believing the accused and saying that these confessions was taken not voluntarily, not freely. They were actually to tortured to actually sign these confessions. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Elton Romeo Hart, a law clinic attorney, University of Johannesburg. Once again, thank you. Thank you and good evening to the viewers. All right. Up next is Business News with Perpetual Fasumi Peters. Business News in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Talking business now, Nigeria's central bank governor said on Monday that a forensic audit of $7 billion of overdue foreign exchange transactions the bank has been trying to clear had uncovered irregularities affecting $2.4 billion worth of transactions. Central Bank of Nigeria Governor Olayemi Kadoso said in an interview that the irregularities ranged from missing paperwork to non-existent entities and beneficiaries receiving unauthorized foreign exchange allocations. Audits conducted by the management consultant Deloitte was aimed at identifying whether there were invalid transactions in the forex backlog, one factor behind the narrow slide. The largest economy is experiencing crippling dollar shortages that have pushed its Naira currency to record lows. We now tell you that project acquisition of Multi-Choice Group is on hold. The decision to pause the offer follows the board's conclusion that the offer grossly undervalues the company. The Multi-Choice Group announced on Monday 
thus ending pursuing further talks with Vivendi's Canal Plus. The French firm Canal Plus made a bid on Thursday to purchase any share of multi-choice for 105 rands. That's about $5.55 per share. Plus said the offer worth 31.7 billion rand, according to estimates, was a 40% premium to multi-choice's closing share price of 75 rand on January 31. Away from that, America's chief executive officer, Duncan Wanblad, has said that the firm is in the early stages of exploring for copper and cobalt in Zambia's northwestern province. He made the comment at the ongoing African mining in Daba in South Africa on Monday. He added that mining jurisdictions across the world are competing for every dollar of investment. The reality of capital being highly mobile and increasingly those countries that are yet are set on making themselves competitive for the long term. Statement backs Anglo-American, indicating that it aims to cut capital expenditure by $1.8 billion by the year 2026, as it grapples with a fall in demand for most of the metal it mines at a write-down for its British fertilizer project. And that's all on business. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo. The news continues shortly. To stay with us. In entertainment, Nigerian superstar Burna Boy and Mumty Award winning uh, singer that's Taylor Swift uh, break Grammy records. Also on the international scene, Drake criticizes the Recording Academy again. And there's some sad news. Renowned cultural icon, that's uh, Jimmy Sholanke, dies at the age of 82. Sam Dandy has more. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. Lana Del Rey, calling her a legacy artist okay. and a legend in her prime. Swift emphasized her love for music and creating, stating that winning an award is as exciting as finishing a song or cracking the code to a bridge. The win solidifies Swift's remarkable achievement in the music industry. Now, Canadian superstar rapper Drake has joined Jay-Z to criticize the Grammy Awards. He took to social media, emphasizing that the ceremony represents opinions rather than an actual or factual achievement. The rapper shared a message on Instagram stories, reminding artists that the Grammy's decision are subjective and not definitive in their world. Drake had previously downplayed the significance of his 2019 Grammy win, stating that the industry's decision might not align with the diverse perspectives of artists. His recent comment reflects ongoing tensions between him and the Recording Academy, with the rapper highlighting the importance of fan support over awards. And rapper Killer Mike was arrested shortly after winning three Grammys this year. The incident occurred at Crypto Arena, where he was taken away in handcuffs. Killer Mike won Best Rap Song, Best Rap Performance for Scientists and Engineers, and Best Rap Album for Michael. The reason for his arrest is currently unknown. And finally, some sad news. Renowned cultural icon Jimmy Sholanke is dead. The 82-year-old dramatist folk singer, playwright, and poet passed on in the early hours of today, Monday, February the 5th, after a brief illness. He died en route to the Olabisi Onobanjo University Teaching Hospital. Born in the year 1942, he was a pioneer member of the Orishu Theatre Group, founded by the renowned Wale Shuinka. His contribution to the global entertainment industry spanned seven decades, leaving an indelible mark on various platforms from the Western Nigerian television in the 1960s to international festivals in Senegal and Algeria during the 1970s. Sri Lanka's versatility shone through his epic performances, such as Death and the King's Horsemen, Kurumi, The Divorce, amongst others. His captivating stage craft and theatrical brilliance earned him accolades and recognition both locally and internationally. The Oxford Times hailed him as a skilled Nigerian actor, and the New York Times recognized him as the star of an excellent troupe during a performance of Wally Shoinka's Konji's Harvest. Jimmy Sholanke is survived by his wife, Chief Mrs. Toyin Sholanke, and his passing marks the end of an era in the Nigerian entertainment industry. May his soul rest in perfect peace. Well, that's much you can take on entertainment. I'm Sam Dandy, back with the rest of the news. And that's a wrap on the news at this time. But before we go, another look at some of our top stories.
We told you that kidnappers abduct passengers of two Abuja-bound luxury buses in Kogi state. Senegal parliament begins debate on proposed election postponement as authorities temporarily shut down internet after protests. We also told you that South African president opens mining investment conference in Cape Town. Don't forget to send in your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on socials. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Dakbo. I dig boy.